Okay, chat, can you believe it is the 23rd of February? <laughs> Where's it all going? Um, hello, good evening, and how is everybody? Um, we're episode 128. It's Chalky Chat. Um, how's everybody doing? Is everybody good? Is everybody well? Is everybody busy? Is everybody doing chocolates? I see Stuart, how you doing? Billy's there. Oh gosh, there's lots of, lots of, lots of, um, lots of new names there. So Bonnie Eats, Sydney, um, Francesca, Ron's Bonbons. How you doing, Ron? They were some nice, um, they were some nice bonbons you did, Ron. Very got a crackly throat um it's all been it's all it's all been um it's all been hands-on classes this week so my apologies i'm not being very good at um at answering all the stuff this week because it's just we get the hands-on class and it's dedicated we don't do anything else i'm not doing any other productions and it's kind of real focus on that but it's like day after day after day after day um and it means everything else kind of get, gets a little bit abandoned so my apologies if you've messaged me and haven't answered i will get to them all get to them at some point um how is everybody doing? Billy did some um, nice Friday chocolates. Um, who else? Chapel Lane chocolates. How are you, sir? Um, oh my God, I'm just going to say some hellos out. Send some waves out. Um, who else have we got? Mrs. So Sassy joined us. So many chocolates. There's a new name. Not seen you before, but welcome. Mother Baker's there. How are you doing, Mo? Uh, Hashim there. We had uh, Sunday, we had the Cocoa Butter class. And then it's been hands-on classes all week, so um, everything, like all the projects have stacked up and everything's kind of all backed up. So, and we've got a busy weekend, we've got a busy week ahead of us, so, um, and more hands-on classes, which is, um, do you know, that's how it goes, isn't it? Um, for the very wonderful Maggie's there. Hi, Maggie, how are you? Um, and Jackie. Um, so, Andrew there at Styling Chocolates up in Aberdeen. Uh, Chocodilic, Evelyn, how are you? See, I, I see a couple of hands-on classes this week. We had a, a young lad, um, Christian, I'm sure he's watching tonight. Christian's flew all the way from Bogota in Colombia to come do a hands-on class. And we had Augusta, Augusta from um, Italy. They, the, the, the questions I get asked on hands-on classes, it's like one is the production and all those other bits. And then somebody did say to me, how do you remember everybody's name and who they are? <laughs> And I don't always, but I, I kind of like, while I'm doing this, I have to scroll through everything trying to go, oh, no, no, what's their name, what's their name? Um, but it's all good. So we've got Yasmin Chocolate in the Netherlands. Um, Yasmin Chocolate, her daughter is 10 years old. She did some chocolates the other day. Um, absolutely amazing. Keep doing that. Keep encouraging children. Get them into business. Teach them how to be entrepreneurs. Um, teach them how businesses run get them to stand up on their own feet and create their own businesses um, with success that can make their own decisions and do all those amazing things. We do with our girls. It's never too soon to start learning a skill. And it's also never too late to start le learning a skill. So, um, so yeah, do that. But Yasmin, Yasmin's daughter's 10 years old. She's in the Netherlands. She did some amazing chocolates. I think that was her first go and absolutely amazing. So, um, who else? We've got um, somebody in Mexico. Can I get Aisha Coco sent to my home? We do post to Mexico. Um, not gonna lie, it does take a little while. It's kind of three weeks, but it does get there. We have had quite a few orders go to Mexico. And I believe if you go onto the website and you get to the shipping stage, uh, Mexico is there, um, definitely. We don't ship to every country in the world. Some countries have some real challenges getting into, so. Um, David Lilly there, how you doing David? He's up in Edinburgh. Um, when the hands-on class will be. No, Hashim, you have to fly over for it. Um, pretty fancy chocolates there down New Zealand. Um, we constantly do it. We're constantly doing hands-on classes. It's uh, It has got busier and busier and busier with the hands-on classes. Scheduling that and, and running all the other bits and pieces that we do with all the other projects and this stuff, It's it's got, it, it has gotten crazy, crazy, crazy busy. Not complaining, I love being busy. Sometimes you look at the diary and you go, am I supposed to get stuff done? But you know what, here you go. Question, AW reading, is there a chart? How long does 065, uh, 0645 last um, out of a chocolate bar? 064, right, with AW, those charts, um, those charts in terms of, it's a suggested. So there will never be a specific, um, 
it lasts 180 days or it lasts 172 days. So it's a suggested uh, water availability and we know from shelf life testing, we know from um, tracking back and looking at products. 06, 064 is really, really good. I would have thought that's something like six to eight months. Um, I would have thought that's six to eight months. The reason it's not specific is when they test for AW, they will test uh, a sample um, ideally you test six samples um, but you need to test it over a series, a series of dates right so if you test it on day one it'll give you one thing if you test it on day 30 it'll give you another slight different reading if you test it on day 30, 40, 45, 50, 60 they'll give you different readings and they'll give you that average right so lab testing will do that and it's periodic testing that they, they look for mould growth and bacterial growth the AW is only suggested because it's it's normally done at a relative humidity of 50% and also it's done at 25 degrees. Well, if the room's colder, say the room was like 18 degrees, the shelf life would extend. So the AW for that one, 0645 or 064, I would suggest, that sounds to me like it's kind of a six to eight month. Um, once we get to 059, it's it's like it's, it's never ending. It would then go down to um, storage conditions, how it's held, uh, what humidity, what temperature, whether we've got any oxygen and moisture ingress. So, is that package hermetically sealed? Is it backpacked? It would last longer. Um, the lower the temperature, the longer. So, there's lots that goes into it. I think a lot of people get get smaller producers, people that are starting off, they get drawn into this AW. It is only a suggested shelf life. There is not one chart that fits all because we test at 25 degrees and we test at 50% humidity. Um, I, I, I answered this, I've got stuff flashing down here. Um, I answered this on the Chalky Chat earlier about caramels and um, somebody pointed out that whilst you can have a long shelf life, on my website, my information to my customers are um, eat them within two weeks of receiving them. Consume by date and use by date or best before date are very, very different things. A best before date will be scientifically challenged with information that suggests beyond that date there would be a physical breakdown um, and there would be biological growth and, and, and the food would spoil. Okay, A best before date is, um, for instance, bread. If the room is really, really cold, you had a loaf of bread and the best before date was in three days time, it might get to day four, day five, day six. Okay, so the room conditions are, are an example. The consume by date is, is I put on there because I don't know how the customers are going to look after it. So whilst I have chocolates as an example, uh, where are they? Well, I have chocolates and I can say, you know, um, I, I will put on best before or use what well, I put on a best before date. So I'll put a best before date of, of 30 days, um, but I want them to eat them within two weeks, right? I know they're going to last longer than 30 days. Um, 30 days is, is normally about half the shelf life for me. So if I give customers, if the date on there is 30 days, I know it will go a little bit more because I don't know what customers are going to do them. I don't know how they're going to store them. I don't know how they're going to look after them. Are they going to sit in a room at 26, 27 degrees and, 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 and spoil quickly? Or are they going to be in a room or put in a fridge at 12 degrees and they go, well, I'll eat them in three, four, five months time. So AW is suggested. What the customer then does with it, that's, that's a very different thing. Oh, it's a very different thing. Um, what else? Me too. After five times asking, somebody said their name and it gets embarrassing and I have to resort to dial it. I, I could, I'm very good at remembering names and I'm very good at remembering faces. Um, I think that's because I can't see colours. That's what I'm going to blame it on anyway. So, um, are the once ones back on yet? Um, no, just give me, just give me a couple of days. I'm going to, I'm going to have a look at those next week. We are, my absolute apologies, we are so backed up with so many projects at the minute because there is the online sales and then there is the offline sales. So the bigger producers don't order through the website, they order separately and that stuff goes off all over. And we, not me, Mrs. So Sassy, she spends a long time doing invoices and doing all these bits and pieces and then we've got a stock take because it's not on the website stock control. So 
give me a couple of days. I, I would I would have thought by the mid next week, yeah, I can get some classes back on and um, we'll kind of be back to service as normal, right? Um, fusion chocolate. I'd love a hands-on class a year. That can be done. Things change. We've got different equipment. We've got different. You know, we're thinking of scaling up some things to do. Um, the hands-on class is like a beginner stage and then one that's a little bit more advanced so I can set up slightly differently and have the stuff made and prepared so that when the advanced students get here we can do guitar cutting and we can do bigger amounts of what will be scaling up um, so yeah that's something we're considering at the minute so um, Stephanie there Forest of Chocolates Forest Road Chocolates I remember the address um, Googled it as well, that's beautiful. In Canada. Uh, morning all, sadly missed Chalky Chat uh, today as we're going on a family kayak accident. Happy days! Go kayak, catch your fish. Um, Stuart's saying it's got sorbitol in it. Yeah, sorbitol's a really good binder. I'm gonna answer this question. I'm gonna answer this question about caramels because if, if anybody's not in the Chalky Chat Facebook book page, I answered that. Um, I had, a f I had a few fleeting moments in my day today, and it's like, right, I'm gonna sit down and answer this, because it always comes to this question with caramels about um, glucose and inverted sugar um, in, in caramels, okay? And, and, and I'll answer it here, and I'll answer it the same as, as I did. Part of that question I've already answered to do with shelf life, and I can have, you know, if I do pralines, oh, do you know, I got a lecture this week on, um, I always say ganduja, right? Yanduja. Because Augusta said you don't pronounce it right. Um, I'm not going to say English is my first language, but I did grow up speaking German, so we're, I'm challenged. Um, so I answered that earlier. So if I do a if I do a box and it's the majority, if I do a box and the majority are yanduyas, pralines, and caramels, okay, um, I'm going to have a really good long shelf life. If I've got a ganache in it, the, the ganache will be the shortest shelf life product I've got. Okay, um, so the ganache might have a six week shelf life on it, but I'd still give it a month because it gives me just a bit more um, safety net, if that makes sense. Going on to the question of the caramels, sugar is sucrose, okay? The reason sometimes you see um, caramels, and this, this goes back to my days way, way, way back at the beginning. When we learned to make caramel, not fruit caramels, that's a different thing, okay? Um, when we started making dry caramels, as in, browning the sugar uh, to make a caramel. We weren't very good at heat control and we set fire to a lot of stuff and we'd end up with pans of just jet black caramel. I'm sure there's people sat there going, yeah, that was me. So until you start to master the heat control uh, and the definition of cooking is the controlled application of heat on a food source to make it edible, okay? So heat control is everything. Like if, you, if, you, if you've got a pan and it's boiling hot and you crack an egg in it, it just explodes everywhere. Whereas we crack it in oil, it's kind of around about 80, it cooks slowly and it's absolutely perfect. Same with fish, same with other bits and pieces. So what we do is we, we, would, we were told, we put caramel in there. Now, um, sugar is, starts off as a liquid and it crystallizes. Um, like water, if we apply temperature to it, in which case cold, it crystallizes. So sugar is a liquid in a crystal form. If we apply heat to it, it will turn back to a liquid, but it needs quite high heat. It needs to get to about 110 before it liquefies. If we put a bit of glucose in the pan, when we put the sugar, the sucrose crystals in, they melt into the liquid a bit quicker. When you get better at doing that, when you get better with heat control, um, and I do it, we'll put a pan, I, when I make caramels, dry caramels, I'll put the pan on and we'll put it on a medium heat and I'll leave it there for five minutes until the pan gets really, really hot. Then we'll turn the heat down and I will judge how much sugar I put in to start with that will cool the pan. And all I want to do for that first addition of sugar is to stir it so that I get a light colored liquid. Now I know that any other sugar that I put in there will turn into a liquid. Does that make sense? So we need a liquid to get the crystals to turn into a liquid. The reason we would use glucose is it just helps the students in the beginning. Here's the thing that you need to consider as well. Sugar is sugar, sugar is sucrose, all sucrose is all, all sucrose is sucrose, okay? So whether it's, it's all behaves the same, whether it's um, 
white sugar, brown sugar, or some of the like the damp sugars, so the blended sugars like the muscovado and the soft light brown, dark light brown. Um, they're, they're all sugars, but they might have molasses in it. If we if we put too much glucose in there, so if you have 300 grams of sugar and 100 grams of glucose, you're going to make a, a caramel and it will brown. But the glucose at room temperature is fairly liquid, whereas the sugar, as we cook it and it gets higher, will solidify again, which is how you get the, the, the shattered glass. So the more glucose you've got in there, the softer the caramel is going to be. If you get the technique of doing a dry caramel and do it properly and you slowly take it up to temperature all those crystals will dissolve into a liquid and you, you don't need the sugar you don't need the glucose sorry to to, to slow down the crystallization it won't recrystallize providing there's no water in there and there is some fat content to bind it you're getting a little bit sciencey now <coughs> if the recipe calls for glucose whether it's 10 percent 20 percent 30 percent it doesn't really matter um what it means is it will be a much, much softer caramel. So you might need to cook it much, much higher. Or you cook it to 107, or you cook it to 108. Or you do what I do, I like to cook it to 104, and I use additional fats to set a caramel. Uh, and what that means is um, I'm a big fan of getting more chocolate in your chocolate. So with the recipe that's on my page, we'd have 200 grams of sugar, 200 grams of cream, um, three grams of salt. We would boil the cream and the salt so that all dissolves in. We'll caramelize the, dry caramelize the, the sugar. We'll blend those two together because that made me a really nice caramel but it's pourable and it's very, very soft but we'd boil, boil that up to 104, okay? Then I'd do 95 grams of chocolate. We'll put that in and put a stick blender but that will, I've got a mold here. That's enough. That would make me about 330, 333 grams of caramel. So that recipe of 200 grams, there's no glucose, it's just kind of two ingredients, right? Sugar and salt, uh, sugar and cream. Make me about 300, 320, 330 grams of caramel. That's enough to fill one of my molds, which is why I did that recipe. If it's got glucose in there, I would reduce some of the sugar and I'd replace it with glucose if it was somebody struggling to get dry caramels done, right? Wet caramels is not something I do because you you would you would put the sugar into the pan sugar goes in the pan first, then the water, okay? And then we turn the heat on until it's dissolved and we don't stir, we just let it dissolve on its own. If you start stirring that, all the water goes up the edges. Now you need to get a brush and you need to rinse down the edges of the pan, a wet brush. And you're trying to boil the water out to create a caramel, but to stop it crystallizing, you have to get a wet brush. And uh, So I'm not a fan. There's a few reasons that you do a wet caramel when you're sanding nuts, when you're doing a few applications, but generally not something, not something I do generally. Um, fruit caramels are a slightly different thing because fruit caramels, we generally wouldn't... Um, generally we wouldn't um, caramelize that sugar first okay so we do the fruit juice we do the sugar because we've got high water content when we boil it it's a bit like making a wet caramel we take that kind of up to 110 the sugar isn't going to brown because it hasn't gone above that 162 168 mark um, and then we'd use fats well that will need some glucose to stop it recrystallizing because there's not going to be any fats in there uh, and we haven't got pro we haven't got pure sucrose that's kind of inverted with the heat I'm trying to make this really really simple so fruit caramel is a different thing um generally speaking though if you took equal amounts of sh white sugar and a fruit juice and you put them in a pan and you do it over a low heat until everything's dissolved and then you bring it to the boil and you bring that up to about 107 you kind of need about 10 percent fat so whether that's sugar or butter or cream as an example um, and if you were going to put in like we know we know that cream is kind of 35 36 percent so you just track back you, you you'd need to put that 10 percent fat in there and then that that will just slow down the crystallization as well inverted sugar in caramels when i see that recipe does absolutely nothing and for for everybody <coughs> For everybody that's that's seen Chalky Chat before, let, or, or for those that are new, let me explain something with um, glucose and inverted sugar, okay? 
if we drew a line and we'll call that zero, okay? Above that line, we'll do a mark up here and we'll call that 100. And then below that line, we'll have minus 100. So we've got this line in the middle. When you've got a glucose and it says DE, so dextrose equivalent, DE40, it would, be, it would sit on the 40 mark, so 60 down, okay? So it's, it's kind of 60% less sweet than sugar, okay? If, so that's, if it's DE60, it would see, sit at the 60 mark, okay? So it's less sweet than, than sugar, which is the sucrose, which is the, the, that middle line. Inverted sugar is the other extreme. Inverted sugar is really, really sweet. So inverted sugar could be 125, 140, 150. So that's double the sweetness of sugar. If you're making a caramel, it's quite sweet anyway. Why would you, why would you need to use inverted sugar? What's the point? Yeah. Uh, and glucose and inverted sugar are more expensive than sucrose sugar and sugar crystals. So all it's doing is making your recipe expensive. I, I do look at some recipes, some chefs, and I do kind of scratch my head. Maybe there's something I don't. Um, inverted sugar's got no place at all, I think, I believe, and I know, in caramels. It, it does nothing. It absolutely does nothing. What it will do is oversweeten it. And if you do fruit caramels, you don't want to add you don't want to add inverted sugar to fruit caramels because we're not changing the flavour of that sugar, we're just boiling it up to a temperature to make sure all the water's gone. What we're going to be left there with is hydrated sucrose with a reduction of the fruit juice that's in there, so it's going to be very sweet anyway, right? Anyway, I hope that answers it for everybody. That was kind of long winded. Try not to make it too, um, to try not make it too, too sciencey. Um, can you please give us the steps for a beauty shiny chocolates? No, I can't because there's many steps, um, and they're not complicated steps. You need a clean mould. They need to be clean. Don't get obsessive with polishing. The shine comes from many, many steps, and it is, and it is. It would, it would take me two or three hours to explain it on here. And there's 100. And, there's probably close to 200 hours of class off here. We temper the cocoa butter, but we need to temper it properly and we need to look after the beta crystals that are in it and we need to paint it. And then we need to leave it to crystallize and go rock hard. Then when we shell, we need to shell the chocolate tempered so that we've got beta crystals. Beta crystals are this mass and then when it cools down, they shrink. We call it retraction, but they shrink. Let's change that word. Retraction it depends on which side of the mold you're looking at, it, isn't it? Because this way it retracts, but this way it contracts, right? We need to get many, many steps right, and it's about tempering cocoa butter, it's about tempering chocolate, it's about protecting the temperatures and knowing where, what temperature should we shell at, what should the room be at, have we got airflow, leaving it through that dry phase and then making sure it drops cool enough, ideally below 14 degrees, with some airflow to make that chocolate set and shrink so it comes out. If you get the shrinkage and the tempering right, the chocolate will reflect the surface of that mold. So, what, oh, I've got some here, look, from yesterday. Oh, it's a different mold. Oh no, yeah it is. So, let me get those off there. This is yesterday's class, and we did, and all the classes this week, I bet we did close to 100 different techniques. It will retract and it will mirror the surface it's touching. If you get a couple of those stages wrong, it's not gonna be shiny and it'll come out dull. Um, and there's not one step. Polishing your molds obsessively is not gonna give you shiny chocolates. Knowing what the temperatures are and knowing what temperatures you use it. And then as your temperatures change in your room, for anybody that's done the hands-on class here, you'll know exactly what I mean. We have to learn to react to what's happening in our environment. You can have air conditioning, as soon as somebody opens the door, big waft of air comes in, you close the door, everything gets wet and humid because it's condensation and you have to wait for the air conditioning to come back down again. So there is so much. I'd love to be able to say these are all the things that you need to do, but there are so many steps within those stages. Um, chocolate work, um, I'll, sum chocolate up, I'll sum chocolate work up, okay? It's lots and lots of little things done really really well in the right order and when you get them in the right order you get chocolates that are 
they've got the snap, they've got the shine, they've got the good texture, they've got good capping, um, they will hold their weight, they will hold the filling, you will get the shelf life. Um, so many, so many things come from doing all those tiny little steps right. My classes go through all that. Um, so, I hope that answered that. Um, nice haircut, yeah, I've got, to, got to get a haircut. Um, how can I get in touch with you? Um, I've answered that. Send me an email. Um, send me an email. Sales at so sassychocolate.co.uk. Um, hello in Stockholm, Chrissy. Um, quick question. Is there anybody else that's addicted to buying moulds? I saw a lovely tulip mould that might be nice for Mother's Day. Can I just say, with the moulds, we, we had a class. So the class yesterday, we were doing different designs, different moulds, different things. I don't think I've got the mould in here. Have I got it still? No, I don't. We made some lovely chocolates and they like this teardrop shape. And then at the end, we put everything together, but the teardrop, as lovely as they are, they don't fit in the, they don't fit in the boxes. So, so we kind of had to pile them in. Um, don't, some moulds are for show, some moulds are for show, some moulds are for dough. And what that means is some like domes, that's for making money. It fits in the packaging. I can fill them. My recipes work in them. They're easy to clean. They're easy to look after. We can buy lots of the same one and it will work. If you keep buying lots of different molds, you will see eventually that you put a little post on Facebook saying, selling these molds because I don't use them anymore. Um, some are lovely to have for show, okay? But they're not good for production. Um, and if you've got molds with lots of little tiny nooks and crevices and angles, um, not only are they um, hard work to polish and clean, they're an absolute nightmare um, when it comes to trying to work out volumes for fillings, finding packaging for them and all the rest of it. So um, if you're not selling box, if you're not selling chocolates in boxes and you're doing like presentation selections, absolutely perfect, but buy the molds that fit your packaging. Number one tip, right? Um, talking of being colourblind, have you seen the Welsh and Irish rugby teams will play in red and green? Yeah, that's an absolute nightmare. Um, I can't. I'm not so bad. Reds, I'm not so bad. Green, green and red together, I really struggle with. Pink and yellow, I can't see at all. Can't, can't see them at all. Um, what's the most colour common colour blind? Red and red and green, I think. Uh, mine's CP, mine is CP4, so it's four categories of colour. So, um, fancy Nancy's joined us in Canada. Hello. Um, I made dark chocolate, orange, cinder toffee, crunchy, good add on products, cheap too. Yeah, make things that people want to buy. Make things that people want to buy, okay? Um, I've had this conversation all week this week. Every student this week, you've had this conversation. <laughs> Make, and I talk to hundreds and hundreds of businesses, right? Make stuff that people want to buy. It's nice to do some fancy things and have them in the corner, but if they're not selling, don't go near them. And if you look at your products and go, oh, they're a little bit boring, but they're selling, that's business, right? You, you will have opportunities to do um, experiments or to do some one-off bits and pieces. Um, but like your your core stuff every day is kind of salt caramel or hazelnut or or peanut. It, it, that that's just that's business, right? Make stuff that people want to buy. That's the key. Um, speaking of caramel, if I were to make an orange caramel, would I add orange juice or puree, or reduce the orange juice? I would do. Um, you want really really good oranges, really good oranges. Um, take the zest off, keep that separate. Um, put that on a board, let that dry out. Um, and yeah, you just, you kind of, the juice and puree, kind of same thing. One's got pulp, one hasn't. Ideally, if you're going to make caramel, I'd use the, the, the strained juice because those little bits in there will catch and burn. Um, process it as you would a normal, as, as you would a normal caramel. But what I would do uh, with citrus fruit, if you want the taste of citrus fruit, it's the juice. If you want the flavour of citrus fruit, it's the zest. So you need to both, you need to use both. Okay. And, and. The zest, take the zests off, put them on a board and just kind of let them dry out for the moisture to dissipate because once the water's gone out of the zest, what you're left with is oil. Um, and um, citrus fruits, the skin is just full of oil. So 
which isn't going to, it's not going to disappear and that's where all the big flavour in, in citrus fruits is in the skin. Um, orange and dark chocolate just works, right? Orange and dark chocolate just works. It does so. Oh, Linda, your order's just arrived. Happy days. Um, how much chocolate do you allow per mile for shelling with the Impass 539? Both of them, both of these are 32s, um, and I allow 440 grams. So if I'm doing four moulds, I'll do 1.7 kilo, okay? Um, and then when I tip, when I, when I tap everything out with the 539, which is the straight-sided one, um, when I tap it out, the shells are normally about 62. So 440 grams, but what's left is 62 grams, 62, 63. Uh, that's for four drop chocolate. If I was using a three drop chocolate, it's then a little bit heavier. Um, but yeah, 440, 440 is enough. Uh, you need enough. You don't want to ever shell. I'm sure people have done this. You don't want to ever pour in chocolate to shell and you can't do that last row because it's just, it's a mess everywhere. I'll show you what that looks like. We've got, that's what it looks like. All we tried to do was shell that end yesterday but we ended up getting it there. So you always, you know, you, you just, when we do collections of, of 12, and we'll do 12 moulds of 32, but every chocolate I lose, I've lost a whole box. Because I can't just go through and make one chocolate, can I? That's, that's just impossible. So everything we make, we're trying to protect it. Um, but yeah, we 13. Um, Dallas has joined us. Dallas, I need to get in touch with you this week and we'll see if we can set up a little chat, I think, definitely. Um, Chocolate creams is there, Coco Lily. Um, so we should stop using glucose for caramel. I, just, I don't. I don't think you need it. I just don't think you need it in caramel. Learn to learn to brown, uh, learn to caramelise sugar properly on a lower heat, more slowly, um, and get those crystals to turn into a liquid with the application of heat slowly. And then once you've got that kind of sticky mass, then you can drive the heat up and cook it to 172, 178, whatever your recipe requires. So um, save the inverted sugar for ganache. I'd only use inverted sugar because it's very sweet in a dark chocolate ganache. Um, if I put um, if I put if I put inverted sugar into like milk chocolate and white chocolate, it's gonna be like you know, hey, I have some diabetes, right? Um, because it, inverted sugar is so sweet, so I, I might balance out a dark chocolate ganache with, with inverted sugar, but glucose generally for the majority. And, and both kind of do the same thing. So they, they, will, they will retard or slow down uh, crystallization. Um, they will add some moisture to it. Inverted sugar is better at uh, holding on moisture than glucose, but in terms of shelf life kind of possibility, they're, they're, they're kind of similar. There's, there's other things that go into it. So, Yasmin, do you wipe your moulds with alcohol wipes? I don't know if it's allowed, Muslims. Um, in terms of it being halal, um, it's, a, it, it's, and we spoke to a sheikh about this and I got a really, really good answer. Um, for, for, for restricted diets with alcohol, so religious or otherwise, okay, the alcohol is just a cleaner, okay? So we're not eating it, we're not ingesting it, we're just using it as a cleaner. So it, it's, it, as far as I'm concerned, and as far as the advice that I've sought, it, it's halal. What would be haram, or what would not be allowed, is if you start using this in, or alcohol in the edible element of it, but it's a cleaner. We're not using it for the intention of eating it, we're using it, it's just a degreaser. You can use vinegar, which is a lot, lot cheaper. Uh, just vinegar, um, not neat, but vinegar's just about, about, about um, 25% vinegar, white vinegar, um, spirit vinegar to water, uh, and that will, that will polish the molds. Um, don't necessarily need to do alcohol. If you give them a really good hair dry, and then just go, go through with cotton pads, right? You get really, really obsessed with the with the with the cleaning of these. Um, I don't spend that much time. I tend to clean the outside of it more than I do anything else. Because if everything that one's being used, by the way, we cleaned that yesterday after we turned everything out. Um, there are some there are some bits of chocolate on it around it. But if everything comes out nice and cleanly, we just hair 
with the hairdryer, we just warmed up the mold and we just gave it a clean with one of those and tried not to touch the inside of these and it is just ready to go. Um, the alcohol cleaning, all it is is a degreaser. It's not, you're not going to eat it. So from that sense, it's permitted. Um, you can use vinegar. Uh, you can just give them a warm and give them a, a, a shine with a, a cotton pad's absolutely fine. So, um, but polishing your molds for longer is not going to give you shinier chocolates. Um, it, it doesn't work that way. It, it, it comes from all the other stuff. So anybody that's done my lessons, you'll know exactly what I mean. We we turned out stuff yesterday, and we had we were very humid yesterday. So we the room was like a constant seventy percent humidity yesterday, which is kind of close, but the temperature was quite even around sixteen degrees. So we learned how to work and change things so that um, some of the processes, you know, I knew that at that humidity, I didn't want to leave the chocolate drying for 15 minutes. 10, 12 minutes was more than enough uh, before we needed to force the retraction because the room wasn't quite cold enough. So, um, happy Friday. Um, JC Chocolate there. Jason is starting at home, I think, very shortly. He, he didn't know I was going to tell everybody that, but we're waiting for Jason to start up chocolate production again, aren't we? Everybody in Chockey Chat Crew is waiting for Jason to start chocolate again. Um, can you show a close-up of how the blue grips attach to the back of the mold? Yeah. They're glued in. Try. Shall I get some? Um, where are they? Where are they? So, um, Linda, uh, if you see, uh, you find Mr. Zardos on my page, Mr. Zardos, they're tiny little flat um, pegs, and they, all I will do is upside down, is I'll glue them into the middle there, so that they're below super glue. I only need to put two in mine. Um, I would do three, um, but it's just enough of a grip for me. When you're doing lots of, when you're doing one or two molds, not a major problem. When you're, as everybody will know here, and I'm sure you can go, yeah, yeah that's me. Once you're, once you're in production, you're doing 10, 12, 15, 20, 30 molds. You get a little bit of chocolate on your thumb and it gets warm and suddenly you're like, whoa, hey. And once that drops in everything, you're like, right, I'm gonna have a cup of tea. It just gives me a little bit of strength. I have arthritis, so um, it gives me a little bit of strength just to hold on to that. Um, they're, they're amazing. They've been a game changer for me. Um, Linda on here brought some over for me and they sent some more to me. I only put two in each mold. They're in all my molds. Just a little bit of security that that's that's all it is. But you see Mr. Zardos, he will he I couldn't tell you the price, you need to talk to him, but um this is Linda's husband. He he he's that's his business, so um he does alright, all that. I just super glued them in and they're fine on that side of the mold because it's not it's not a food production side that side. Uh, and once it's dry, it's dry, right? Just don't get any glue on that side of the mold, but um, game changer. Made it, you know, I wish they would design the mold so that human beings could hold them. Um, unfortunately, they're designed by people that don't use them. They're, they're more interested in, they're more interested in the shape, not how would we use them. Um, I really, really struggle with the chocolate world ones, right? There ain't enough room we dropped one yesterday, for example. I've got, I've got less than four mil there to hold on to a fucking mould, right? I can't get my, I can't get my fingers, so I've got to start holding it differently, and I don't like it. Um, but again, they designed it. It's more about the inside of the mould rather than the whole thing. It's just a kind of lack of detail for my, for my personal view. Um, I wish they'd address it. The, Addressing putting grips on it is really straightforward. So, um, I feel you, Stuart. Do you know how many people have got lots and lots of molds that they're selling? Uh, if you're buying molds, just question, just ask yourself why. Are you buying them to make chocolates or are you buying them to show off? And if you're buying them to show off, don't. Do the ones that you've got, all right? paint them nicely, change the style, buy a different airbrush, buy a better compressor. Um, you don't need lots of really different molds. That's not what's gonna make you a better chocolatier. Understanding costings, understanding your process, being able to make them efficiently, 
uh, without wastage, that's what's going to make you a better chocolatier. And then, and then once you've got tens of thousands in the bank, you can go on a spending spree, right? Um, any tips for getting the two halves of an Easter egg to sit together perfectly? Mine tend to go a bit askew. Yeah, answered this one, lots this week. If you've got the mould, leave the bottom one in the mould. It's obviously retracted and then you just want to warm one half. If you give that one a very, very light warm, because we've got slight wet chocolate, sit the other one on that, it's a bit of a... If you're trying to get both halves in your hands to glue together, not so easy. Use the mould for one of them to sit in there nice and snug, and then you can sit the other one on top. That's the best top. You're always going to have a line around it. You're always going to have a line around it. If you have a look at Easter eggs, um, they, they always have this ribbon tied around the outside, right? That's camouflage and concealment to hide it. Um... The, the solid eggs that are on spinners, slightly different process, but you still can see a line, all right? So um, I, I don't mind seeing that. Uh, that says to me that it's handmade, right? If I see two that are snugly fit together and you can't see where it is, it's like, well, that ain't handmade. I like handmade things. So um, use the mould to help you line that thing up. Um, <coughs> What else? Philip Vieira, hello sir. Um, if a recipe has it invert sugar, can you substitute? Depends what recipe, Harry. Um, if it's a ganache, no. If it's a ganache and it's dark chocolate, I wouldn't. I wouldn't change the inverted sugar. Um, I would make your own inverted sugar. Go and have a look at Callie Youngstead's page. Um, Callie's got a really good, um, uh, really really good, straightforward um, inverted sugar, and I think it makes about two hundred grams, which is more than enough. Put it in a jar. I store mine in a fridge. You can leave them at room temperature. It, it probably won't crystallise as long as no additional water in there. Um, it's not a problem keeping it in the fridge. If it's a screw top, if it's a screw top jar, and it's like two hundred grams. Leave it in the fridge, right? Um, you can always give it. A, you can just take the lid off and give it a little warm in a microwave um, to get some out. But would I substitute? I think, the, if I'm honest, I think the only reason to have inverted sugar in there is because it's it's bitter and it would um, tone it down or balance it out a little bit. But, like, if it's a milk chocolate ganache and it's got inverted sugar in it, I'd kind of have to ask why, right? Because milk chocolate's sweet, white chocolate's sweet. Why would you put more sweetener in it, okay? You're just going to completely kill any flavour that was in there. Um, and you can never buy... You can't buy inverted sugar in small amounts. We'll be three kilo tubs. Everybody throws out two kilos of it because it takes them a year to use a kilo right so you might as well just make your own make your own um why does everybody talk about my haircut is it that long since i had a haircut um do you think we could use epoxy putty on the back of the mold instead of these pieces to get a better grip um i use yeah i guess yeah you could um it's whether it's um ellen it's whether it's clean enough or not but all it does you know all Mark has done is he um, he prints these on a on a resin printer, um, and they're they're a little bit sharp on that edge, which is what gives you the ability. Like you can hold on to it with just the tiniest little tippy finger, right? It's um, what I don't want to do. I don't want to touch the mould when I'm shelling because the warmth of my hand is going to just melt. Anybody's ever airbrushed, then you've had your fingers on here on the actual mould bit like that, yeah? And you spray, you'll find that when you leave that, there's a great big hole being burnt in your cocoa butter. Um, so I'm trying to hold those just so that I'm not touching any of it. I, I just want to keep all the temperature even. Um, yeah, I guess you could use some epoxy resin. They're your moulds, you can do with them what you want. You're not touching the working surface, do you know? So, um, Bit like you know, food inspectors who wanted to check underneath of the table, I'm like, but they're not working on that bit of the table. So, yes, it needs to be clean, but why? Why you swab the top of the table where they work? Don't swab the underneath of the table because nobody works there, right? Same as like swabbing the floor. Everybody's walking on it. It's not going to be clean. So it can be clear of debris, but it's never be clean because we work. We're walking on it, but nobody cooks or preps on the floor. So there's pointless swabbing it, right? logic Ellen they're your moulds you can do what you want with them truly right um, <laughs> I 
That is the question. You know, that is the that is the question. It's if customers like lots of different shaped molds, do they though? Do they? Some do. The feedback on the different ones very very good, but the challenge is um, different shape molds, different fillings, different weights. Um, packaging is almost impossible. So, you know, it is how efficient do you want to be, right? How efficient? one more Ribena tonight. Honestly, I'm talked out this way. Me too. Um, Christian Coca is there. I'm gonna say to Christian, he's on a tour. He came all the way from uh, Bogota, Colombia. Come and do a class. Very, very lovely young man. Very talented. Um, loves learning. We went through some temperatures of of how things are done today and our, uh, uh, the other day. And Christian, I told him a few things and I drew out the picture of what happens during that process. Um, and you could see the light switch go on in his head and he's just like, why don't I know that? I've been doing chocolate 10 years, why don't I know this? Um, and this is the thing with a hands-on class. I mean, maybe it's just a style that I teach, but I've got to work out very click quickly whether you're a visual, audible, or, or you know what type of learner you are, so I can get the right example so that you absorb the information. Sometimes you explain something to somebody, and I use the example of, you know, for anybody that's done a class with me, I talk about candy floss, and it's like a light switch, and he's like, oh, I know what I've been doing wrong all this time. I've had all these mistakes so many, so many years, and you've just explained what I've been doing wrong. You're welcome. <laughs> Long way to fly, fly to get that, so. Um, James, can I substitute sorbitol with other types of sugar? Yeah, you know what, um, Cynthia, you, you can use glucose. Um, sorbitol is a, is a, is a um, you know, there's one called malitol. Sorbitol is a brand of um, polyol sugar. So it's an alkali, it's what we call an alkali sugar. Um, but it's a brand. You, you you find it in the medical industry. It's it's a um, it's used as a. It's all. It's you find a laxative medicine. You'll find the key ingredient in it's sorbitol. It's very good at binding up um, water. People have stomach issues. We give them sorbitol. Suddenly they're good, right? We'll leave the, we'll leave the descriptions there. Um, you could swap the equal, you know, I would double the amount of, or probably treble the amount of sorbitol. So if it said 15 grams of sorbitol, I would just go with 45 grams of, of glucose and you'll probably be close, right? So, and, and the same with inverted sugar, but be careful with inverted sugar because it is incredibly sweet. Get some inverted sugar and taste it and you're like, whoa, just, um, yeah, you'll definitely get it. For anybody over, anybody over the age of 45, you'll be running around the room because you'll just have such a massive sugar spike. Um, James, can we substitute? Yeah, I've answered that one. Um, customers get what they think I they like. <laughs> Absolutely. Make what? Make... Um, make things that people want to buy. Um, Sorbitol is wheat based, right? C can tell you. Some will, but yeah, well, it might be derived from corn, okay? Um, this is always a big question I get. Um, when people say to me, I can't, get, I can't get liquid glucose, but I can get corn syrup. Not the same thing. Um, glucose, um, glucose is normally a uh, derivative of, of rice or, or potato, right? Or, or other kind of starch. Um, whereas corn, corn syrup is normally got made with gluten in it, all right? So it's, it's in terms of your labeling, um, I can tell you with sorbitol, it could be corn based, it could be barley based, or it could be rice based. If it's rice and barley based, it's going to be low, no gluten. Um, if it's corn based, it, it will have so, um, different, um, different products, different, you know, it, it, it's a brand of polyol sugar, so. Um, what else have we got? Who else got any questions? I didn't, yeah, Sorbitol. I saw a recipe recently, and it was two grams. It's like a, it was like a liter. It's like a thousand, it's like a thousand gram mix when you added everything together. And it had two grams of Sorbitol, and I looked at it and it's like, there's just no point. Um, 
And then you do a little bit more research and that person was selling products from a an online store and they were trying to get all those named products into the recipe and it's like oh well that makes sense um is dextrose a sub substitute for sorb salt no it's not dextrose uh dextrose is completely different thing. dextrose is very expensive dextrose is very very sweet um the other thing with dextrose as nadia on here explained to us is is the body can't metabolize it very well um Dextrose mostly is is um, a pr production of wheat as well, right? So it's not a, it's not a fair swap. Sorbitol, sorbitol is a polyol sugar uh, with incredible binding. But there's you know there's one called mannitol. There's lots of different brands of sorbitol. So um, if you do a Google search, you'll find polyol sugars. You'll find some some other versions of it. Um, if I'm honest, I think sorbitol is probably the most expensive of them all. But it's the one that's known. Um, there's so much. There's you know there's there's um, malatose. Um, God, there's a there's one called galactose, which I thought was a Star Wars film, but there is a sugar called galactose. Uh, there's so many different ones. Uh, when can we expect new green colour to be available? Starting that tomorrow. There's going to be leaf green coming tomorrow. It'll be Sunday. All the testing and stuff is back from that, so um, it'll be Sunday, I think, before that's loaded. But all the other greens are in stock. Uh, but the leaf green, yeah, pr probably looking at probably looking at Sunday when that when that goes on the website. So uh, leaf green, navy blue, uh, grey is coming on, and then um, might be a couple of weeks. The grey and the taupe, taupe, um, which is a greyish brown. Um, that that's going to be another week or so, ten days. I would have thought before I can do that one. So um, new colours, always busy. Just when I thought I had all the colours, I then added some more. Um, have I missed any questions? Just having a look. Everybody's gone quiet. Why has everybody gone quiet? Is everybody ready for Mother's Day? Is everybody ready for Easter? Are they? Did everybody have a good Valentine's? Did everybody sell lots of chocolates for Valentine's? Was the feedback good? Um, uh, new to Chocolate Chat, have you done any chats on Melanges? I'm in the market for one. Uh, I like the Premier Melanges. Um, the 2.5 litre tilting one works for me. I know lots of people that use them. Uh, unless you're doing massive, massive volumes, I, I think two and a half litres is more than enough to do the nut paste that you'd need, or the pralines. Um, so, yeah, two, two and a half litre. The difference between a wet grinder and a refiner is not much. There ain't much in it, all right? So, so there's a little bit of a marketing gimmick, if, if you ask me. If I went to the Indian continent, um, Melanges, they're in every household, um, and they, you can go buy them everywhere, and they're really cheap but they tend to cook all the spices off, put them in there with tomato and all the other bits and pieces and oils. And then they just run them to make the curry pastes and like every house has them. And then I saw the, so there, they're really, really cheap. By the time they get here, it's like they've, they're time, 10 times the price, right? Um, shop round for Melanges. You get, um, you, you know, you get, um, you get what you pay for. Uh, just be careful. There's this little one that's like a machine and next to it's the barrel. Um, and I know lots of people have struggled with those. They're just not quite powerful enough. Um, I prefer the one that's got the drum that sits on top. You bolt down the wheels. Um, it tilts. The only advantage of a tilting one is you can kind of put a little bit less in there. So if you wanted to do like 500 grams, 600 grams, you can just by tilting the machine. You have one wheel running. Um, other than that, 2.5 litre, it kind of works for me for the volumes I do. And I know lots of... Um, producers of chocolate that, that that they're quite happy ours tends to come out once or twice a month so we don't use it all day every day but once or twice a month it will come out and it will do all the nut pastes with you know just like the hazelnut the cooked almond the white almond the cashew nut the macadamia um and pistachio and then flat finally like the flowery nuts where we do um uh, walnut and pecan so we have got a Melanger class, which is off at the moment, but I'm hoping next week we'll kind of look back on with that one. So, um, 
Valentine's is quiet for me again, but gearing up for Easter. Happy days. Um, we skip Easter, but go straight for Ramadan Eid. Yeah, Ramadan Eid is 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 coming up very very. Or Ramadan is coming up very very shortly. At the end of Ramadan, it will be Eid, and it will be chocolate eating season. So, um, if you have a market that's near to that, it's worth pitching some of your some of your products towards um, Eid. Um, and if you use that hashtag and like Ramadan twenty twenty four, you might pick up some you might pick up some some orders that way as well, right? So, um, didn't make for Valentine's Easter and Mother's Day production starts Monday. Yeah, happy days. Um, all happy. I'm excited. I'm excited for Easter. Although all the talk on radio today about chocolate prices is scaring people to buy rubbish, cheap supermarket eggs. Yeah, it is. Um, the media's ramping it up. Other people are ramping it up. The price of cut. You know. The, the the growing state um in west africa was 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 really really bad with with weather so the yield that they got is really really low here's a reality though that, that people aren't talking about the chocolate that you're using now was was with the 2021 production okay and this is where it doesn't make sense to me i'm trying to get an answer on this from somebody at the moment or the people that we talk to anyway I'm trying to get an answer on this because production hasn't changed in Central and Southern America, hasn't changed at all. Um, they had a bumper year. So one should have ups offset the other. Um, the news is ramping it all up. The biggest producers of chocolate are using a product that they bought two years ago and it's not bonded. So they have it in their stock. They're just using this as an opportunity to put the prices up. So... Um, and the prices re rarely come back down again. So it dep I said this the other week. It, it depends where you read it and what you read. Um, I saw somebody post earlier a stock market report and I went into the one that we use and, and they, the figures weren't even close. So uh, and that, they're claiming that, you know, that was a FTSE 100, but it wasn't. It was just a graph. And it was painted on and that, you know, cocoa is now at 5,086 a tonne, a metric tonne. So um, I don't know. I We watch the market or Rania watches the market very, very closely. Um, it always goes up and it always goes down. And whilst West Africa has had a bad yield, I think everybody's hoping that Central and Southern America will, will ship across and fill in that void, all right? So it might be that the bigger producers that are in Europe are tied to the West African uh, producers and they haven't raised contracts because they just bought in one place right so there's, there's lots that goes into this but yeah it's a little bit scary um people will always go and buy the cheap rubbish shop chocolate they will um there's nothing you can do about it uh, you've got to go and find your customers that value what you make um as an artisan producer and as a um handmade product right could you please explain how to prevent release marks with molds for bars i put them on racks the room temperature is 16 degrees but still um suzanne with the bars okay I've, I've had this conversation with many 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 producers they all do slightly different things however they will get the the they will pour the bars okay and then tap them and they'll leave them as soon as they start seeing the edges start to go dull they will put that in the fridge and they'll put that in the fridge at eight ten degrees and just force it to retract very quickly then it comes out when it's cold then it comes out and it goes on the racking and they leave it for 24 hours how you pour it um, is also a thing if the bottom of that mold is really really cold when the chocolate touches it um, you get this kind of ripple effect and that's what those retraction marks are if you try and pour on top of something, especially if you're like, especially metal tables, right? Not so bad with these, because they're kind of raised, but like the flat bars are very close. Just have it on something when you pour, okay? Um, but for the people I know that have had this issue, um, what they, and at Paula's here, she'll probably say the same thing. Um, what she does is she, she, she pours them, leaves them at room temperature, and just when she sees the very edges, right? I've got them all here. When she starts seeing just the very edges start to dry and go dull, not the whole thing, just the edges, um, she'll put that very carefully into the fridge and just force the whole thing to retract. Now, you might get marks on the back of it, but you won't get the contraction marks or retraction marks on that side of it. Right? 
If you're doing plain bars and there's not cocoa butter, give them a very gentle warm. And when I say gentle warm, a really gentle two, three seconds with a hairdryer, not with a heat gun, right? Heat gun's too hot, Air dry, perfect. Two, three seconds, okay? It will just give time for that chocolate to run, right? And spread out. I think somebody said to me as well, they found that they get less retraction marks when they pipe through a piping bag, right? So, um, mouth explosions. Hello, in Greece. Um, first event of the year tomorrow. Finally, a bit of early morning packaging to do. Oh, Harriet, well done. Share some photos. Novia Bakery. Um, is somebody that I've done quite a few shout outs. Um, more and more cake makers have got hold of our products. Not got hold of, they have purchased our products and they're learning to use them to spray on cakes because it's an organic cocoa bar that tastes really, really nice. Anybody that hasn't used our product, this is how you use the product when you get it. You take the lid off, you just give it a smell um, and, and then you use it for what you should use it for, right? Um, um, Novia Bakery does some absolutely incredible cakes. Uh, cakes by Kirsten is another one. She was doing something with breakfast apps this week. Um, the cake industry is massive and, and we're just seeing a, we obviously sell to chocolatiers, I'm seeing more and more cake makers start to gravitate towards some of our products, which is very pleasing, quite humbling as well. Um, our price is the same here, 95 for 10 kilos of calibre, that's a good price. 95 euros for 10 kilos of calibre, pretty good. Um, yeah, whoever asked about re retraction marks on the bars, that's what Paul is saying, exactly what I said there. So, um, Oh my God, Twisted Tulip. Bought a friend some lovely artisan chocolate for a birthday from a fabulous chocolatier. Asked her later if she liked it. She said, yeah, it was okay. Nearly as good as Cadbury's. <laughs> right, yeah, they're off the birthday card list. Just don't. Just don't ever do that again. Um, buy them and say, I bought you some chocolates, but I ate them. Um... Right, what have we got? It is 9.30, I'm gonna go. I'm, I'm, this, I'm so tired, I'm really tired this week. Proper cooked, proper exhausted. This has been a really, really busy week this week. Um, and we finished the classes yesterday. We finished around about kind of midnight last night after we cleaned up. Um, I was back in making butters this morning and then start more classes. So it, it's just, it's full on. The side of success that nobody ever sees is how frantically you busy you are in small little chunks and it's it's a race to get stuff done most days so um we were planning on having a day off tomorrow but it's not gonna happen <laughs> it's just not gonna happen <laughs> too much to do i will see everybody next week um i may well get the uh one-to-one -one classes back on and going so we just got to address some of the um some of the wording on some of those bits and pieces so hoping to have those back in next week um what else is going on butters are here um, we're available, our prices haven't gone up, we don't need to re react to that market, we bought in advance, that's how we run, that's how we roll, uh, we look at the market before it starts changing. Um, what else, Mr. Zardos, you can find those, find Mr. Zardos, um, Z-A-R-D-O-S, on my, find him on my Instagram, send him a message, he's got his website, you'll be able to find where they come from, because those are a lovely little game changer for chocolate, all right? Um, Jason, JC Chocolates, tell me when you're starting because um, I need to have a chat with you. I might, I might give you a buzz, Jason, this weekend, actually. We'll have a little chat. I'll we'll have a natter with you before you start up, right? Um, keep everybody going in the right way. Be nice to people. Be kind to people. Join the Chocolate Chat page. Um, if you know the answer and you can back it up with some experience, answer. But please don't write any myths like facing north and that weird stuff because I'll just delete it. Um, join a Chocky Chat, have a read, go and read through all those different things, some incredible information there, really, really amazing information. Uh, thank you for joining. Um, what else? Be nice to people, especially those closest to you, all right? Um, have an amazing week, Chocky Chat crew, um, and I'll see you in a few hours for episode 129. Um, I'm going to go and see if I can get hold of uh, Dallas now, and we'll set up a talk, all right? Have a good one, take care.